the difference between augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality? It is a range of experiences. On one hand, we have virtual reality, which is a totally immersive experience where you put on a headset and you are disconnected from your environment. Everything you see and interact is a 3D generated um, object. And on the other hand, for augmented reality, you have a connection to your environment, like in HoloLens, and you have some extra information, maybe 3D or maybe audio information that's available to you, which is augmenting your reality. Also, we have uh, mobile phone applications like Pokemon Go. You are looking through the glass of your phone and you're able to find 3D objects in the real world. And this whole range of experiences we call mixed reality. And short, it's called XR. Welcome everyone. Our next speaker is Keith Lay. Keith Lay is Director of Sales and Marketing for Cleario Technologies. He has extensive experience in digital marketing strategy and client services and has delivered digital marketing strategies to high-tech and engineering clients for over 15 years. This has included uh, providing analysis and managing campaigns for both the public and private sector at a regional and national level. Has Keith, welcome. For welcome, thank you. Uh, welcome to everyone. I'm, I don't know, just a quick technical thing. I'm getting a weird kind of duplication of the audio. I don't know if you can hear that uh, on your end, but it's basically um, like the audio is coming back in a delay. I, I can hear it. Are you on speakers? Yeah. So it could be that the speakers are picking up the, the mic sound. The microphone is right. picking up the speaker sound again. Well, I can turn that off. I won't be able to hear you anymore, but uh, at least we don't get the echo anymore, yes? <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to uh, hand it over to you then. Ready? <laughs> I'm go. Yes. <laughs> Let's do. All uh, right. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. And uh, thanks for coming uh, to the webinar today. Uh, the topic uh, that we're uh, covering is relating to engineers uh, and uh, other folks that work in construction, uh, engineering, uh, large-scale infrastructure, and the need to improve field data capture, uh, organization, and sharing in the three-dimensional uh, XR space. And so I want to kind of talk about uh, a little bit about uh, what the unmet need is in, in this industry, and also uh, what, the, uh, what the options are in terms of solutions for that. Hope everyone can hear me. I uh, just want to get a confirmation from that. So in terms of uh, working in the field, uh, the old school system of notebooks and even with phones and apps, uh, you can leave a lot of useful context behind. Um, so there's a new generation of affordable, accessible, and easy to use hardware and software tools. And what we want to do is take advantage of the latest in georeference text and image capture, 3D scanning, and holographic presentation and remote collaboration. So some of the tools I'm talking about today uh, can be things like the, uh, the new uh, iPad Pro uh, that has the LiDAR scanning built in, and even the iPhone Pro that also has uh, the, the LiDAR scanning built in. And uh, in terms of the mixed reality presentation, uh, we're talking about uh, things like the Microsoft HoloLens uh, that have the ability to uh, project the, the 3D scans that you create in the field and, and create uh, virtual environments for people to meet around uh, site issues. So a little bit of background. Uh, we actually did some research on this to see 
uh, what the unmet needs were in this area. And we, we surveyed field workers from a large uh, international engineering firm of about 500 people uh, to determine the challenges they face when they're managing the data that they've collected. And their feedback fell into three main categories, capture, organize, and share. So let's just look at uh, what some of, the, uh, some of the feedback was in terms of what the needs are for engineers in the field. So we kind of presented this statement as it related to data capture. Uh, it's cumbersome to record multiple data types, notes, images, scans, et cetera, with traditional methods out in the field. And an overwhelming 72% of the people we surveyed agreed with this statement. So there's really a pain point uh, in the industry right now where there's a, there's a need to capture uh, high fidelity uh, data, but also um, be able to access that at a later time in a way that makes sense. And uh, it's difficult to do right now. We put this statement out uh, for review. So disjointed capture processes, such as notebooks and digital cameras, leave the data scattered out of sync and hard to reconcile. And again, an overwhelming percentage of our survey attendees agreed with this statement, that this was a problem that they were having. They were using their digital phone perhaps to capture images. They were using their notebooks to capture notes. Uh, they might even be using uh, drones or other scanning devices to capture 3D scans. But it was basically all over the place uh, in, in different folders and different devices. The information was getting siloed. And uh, so th they were, the, the engineers we spoke to really felt that this was a problem for them, that uh, they weren't getting the best value and the best uh, knowledge out of this data that they were collecting. And then the other one is in terms of sharing this data with others. So this is a, another statement that we put to the group. End user client engagement and stakeholder buy-in is often challenging to achieve with 2D representation of complex data. And again, a very high percentage agreed with this, 63%. And what we mean by this is with almost all projects now uh, could be uh, a construction project, it could be a mining project, it could be a roadway, it could be any number of things, you need to get that stakeholder uh, agreement and buy-in. And when you go with complex data and you show a, a PowerPoint, uh, kind of like what we're doing today, uh, or you show some 2D charts and graphs, it's very hard for those non-technical audiences to actually have an understanding of what it is that you're presenting. And so there needs to be a new and better way to engage these non-technical audiences with the technical data in a way that they'll understand and, and really put them on the site either in the current time or in the future to see what the plans are and give them a clear understanding so that they can have uh, better information to help approve the project moving forward. So based on this research, and that was kind of a synopsis of, of a larger research that we've done, uh, we've developed the Cleario mobile app suite, uh, which allows people to capture, share, review, and resolve worksite field observations, issues, and updates. So it allows you to co collect geo-reference notes, photos, and even 3D scans. And then your colleagues, managers, contractors, or stakeholders can sort, review, compare, and action these field observations in real time. So I want to talk a little bit about you know, what that entails. So in addition to the field notes, we can also add large-scale photogrammetry, LIDAR, CAD, subsurface data can also be added to these workspaces. And here's the really exciting part. Teams can now collaborate as a group in a live remote holographic metaverse meeting around one or more of these 3D objects. And so basically what Cleario app does is it accurately documents a digital twin of observations as the worksite evolves over time. So what are the, what are the component pieces of that? So on the capture side, we've noticed that now uh, more and more people are going out into the field, wherever that might be. Again, it could be a mining site, could be a large scale infrastructure project, could be oil and gas, could be a construction site for a building uh, or a city. And they are taking out these, you know, these inexpensive, easy to use iPad devices. So on the capture side, our software allows for the capture of a variety of data types, photos, text, coordinates, 3D scans on site 
in one easy to use mobile tablet or phone app. So you're not going back and forth to different apps, trying to find uh, the right app to, to uh, capture all of your data. But the, the key thing is that uh, in our application, all of those notes are georeferenced to, to the site and they are also timestamped. So as you start collecting things, we're automatically putting them and sorting them into points of interest uh, on a map of your site and timestamping them so that you can go back and see them in, in terms of times and place at a later time. So again, you can capture notes, images, and scans in one place. So on the organized side, once you've done all your field capture, you can then use the map as a way to organize and group these field notes, images, and scans into that map-based interface. And instead of going through a camera roll or going through a bunch of notes in a note-taking application or going through a bunch of files in the, in, the, in the directory tree, you literally just return to the site virtually. You can walk the site in terms of the map. And this is a much more intuitive way for people in the field to, to remember and to recall the data that they were capturing when they were there. So by making this all georeference and making it tied to a map with these callouts, it's a much more effective and much more intuitive way to organize this data after the fact. And because you can attach multiple versions of these scans and images and notes and be able to filter them based on time, you can actually have the ability to see the changes over time in a, and again, a really accessible and intuitive way. And then finally, there's the share piece. And the share piece is kind of the, the secret sauce uh, of what we bring to the table. So what we have is uh, a virtual meeting, uh, kind of metaverse, if you will, uh, for the 3D data that you capture in the field. And this comes from a need to have experts uh, view problems and react to problems and solve problems in near real time. So if someone in the field comes across an issue uh, that could be something geological, that could be something related to construction, that could be something related to uh, plans, and they want an expert to weigh in on that. You know, in the past, the expert would have to, wherever they were, were come to the site, and that could be you know, hours or days. So now what we have is once that, that data has been captured as a scan is in our system, you can invite multiple users to join a virtual session to share and collaborate on that site data via what we call remote collaboration. So in the image we see here, we see someone on the HoloLens that's viewing the, the previously scanned uh, item in 3D. And someone is joining that uh, on an iPad. So it could be done through a variety of different devices. And these people don't even need to be in the same room. They can be anywhere in the world that they have an internet connection. So you can invite any outside stakeholders to access the site data for review and input. And you can collect, organize, and share that data with a speed and ease and transmit those critical updates to key decision makers in near real time. So this really eliminates that, that delay on projects where you have to wait for that expert to come to the site. You can now bring the site to the expert through this virtual meeting capability, and then they can weigh in and, and basically make decisions and move projects forward much faster. And then finally, we have the visualize piece. So as I mentioned before, along with the 3D scans that you can do on site through the iPad, there's also more complex 3D data that other people on your project team may be working on. So this could be CAD structures to show how things will look in the future in terms of uh, the built environment. Uh, this could be subsurface information in terms of uh, boreholes, uh, geophysics data, seismic data, uh, ground-based radar, that sort of thing. And we can also have all of these, all of this data georeferenced and layered together. So along with the field notes that you're capturing, you can have other people of your team bring their data and have that all georeferenced to the project as well, so that you can have a complete holistic end-to-end -end view of what's going on in that project. So you can have the field observations, you can have the subsurface data, you can have the CAD data, and all of that stuff is available to be shared and viewed in that 3D holographic remote collaboration environment as well. So whether you're working with experts or whether you're actually bringing in governmental review boards or bringing in uh, non-technical stakeholders, you can use this visualization capability to create a very compelling and easy to understand uh, visualization of what's happening with all aspects of the project. So along with the field note capture and along with the 
uh, more complex uh, 3D subsurface and surface data, we now have the ability to create these very complex visualizations that can be shared virtually with, with anyone in, with, in the world with an internet connection. So I want to go through how this works. So that's kind of the concept of what we've uh, uh, brought to the market. And I want to just quickly go through and uh, kind of discuss with you uh, how, how this works. So basically, uh, you download the, uh, the Cleario app. And this is an app that's, uh, that's available for uh, the iPad. Now, in terms of working with, um, with many of the aspects of this, uh, almost uh, any iPad or iPhone will do as long as it runs uh, iOS 14 or later. But uh, the, the caveat being that if you want to do the 3D scanning portion, uh, you would need to have uh, the, uh, uh, the iPad Pro that has the built-in LiDAR capabilities. But it basically starts with a workspace. So a workspace is a geographically located uh, area in, in virtual space that is based on where you're at when you, when you start creating these, this data scanning. So you can put in manual coordinates if you wish, but the, usually the way is you go to the site, you start your work, and a workspace is generated, and a map, a three-dimensional map, is auto automatically created for where you are. So from there, you start creating what are called observations. Now, observations are based on points of interest. So a point of interest is a pin on the map. So think of, if you think of uh, looking at a Google map in 3D and you see all of the different pins, uh, and that's what a point of interest is. So a point of interest is basically uh, a collection of information that is geographically tied to a point in the map. So when you create a first POI, you will give that a name uh, based on what it is you're planning to collect uh, for that part of the project. And again, you can override the, the coordinates, but it's usually based on the coordinates of where you're literally standing on the field uh, when you create it. So once you've got a point of interest, you can now start to attach observations. So if we think of the hierarchy of how this works, we have the workspace, which is the entire site. Think of a, uh, of a 3D map of your project area. Uh, and then you have a point of interest, which is like a pin on that map, uh, which basically uh, says that there's something of interest at this physical location. And then we have observations, which are the actual data themselves. So within that, we have the ability to create our data. So to create an observation, we select a point of interest. And again, we can have point of interest all over our map. And then we want to choose what type of observation. You'll see that we have four here. We have photo, we have upload photo, we have uh, note, comment, and we have a scan. So you have basically the four different types of, of data that you can uh, create. So photo is basically taking an image through the device that you're holding. Uh, uploading a photo is the ability to take a photo that you've already shot earlier on your camera roll. Uh, a comment is just basically a text note uh, that you can uh, ge geolocate to a point in the map uh, for further information. And then a scan is, is the ability to take a 3D scan with a LiDAR compatible device. So if you choose photo, uh, your full screen immediately, you're, so you're not having to switch out to different apps. So the, immediately your full screen becomes a camera and you can point it at the uh, area that you want it to start capturing that, that visual data. And you tap on the screen, and you've taken the photo. And then you have the ability to give a title uh, to this, a description to this, as well as adding tags. So tags are another way that you can really powerfully uh, search and sort and collect information uh, at a later time when, you're going, when it's time to organize the information. So once you've taken that photo and give it a name, all of the other work is being done automatically behind the scenes for you. It's time stamped, so you can easily make comp comparisons between what the site looked like today and what the site looked like yesterday. Uh, and it's also georeferenced. So this is now immediately tied to the point of interest, that, that pin that's on the map. And so when you come back to the map at a later time and you're viewing and walking the site, you can actually easily recall what it is you did, where you did it, and when you did it. So this data doesn't become lost anymore. When you click on scan, your whole uh, iPad Pro immediately becomes a 3D scanner. 
And uh, so you, you, if there's a particular thing of, on the site that you need to have someone look at in more detail than just a photo, you tap the record button and you start to move around the object. And whether, you know, whether that's small or large, by moving the iPad around and walking around the object, you're literally creating uh, a three-dimensional object of that in the app. So once you've actually done that uh, and press the record button to stop, there's a couple of steps to give it a name and, and save it. But now you've added this 3D scan to the point of interest, which is now attached to the map. So at any time, you, you or someone else can come back to the site uh, and review it, and they can see what it is that, the, that you've created. So this, again, really brings a lot of power uh, to those people in the field to create much more complex observations than they would have in the past. You know, if you think about how this was in the past, someone might take a photo of an issue on the site that, that required immediate attention by an expert, and then perhaps they would text or email that to someone. Then the expert would try to understand the full context of what was going on with that issue. And more often than not, they would either ask for more information or they would actually go have to go to the site themselves to really look at it. So now we can come to a place where we have the ability to create a 3D scan of that. So we now have a three-dimensional object, which is far more information and far more context for that expert to review. And because it's easy for the field worker to do, we don't need specialized equipment. We don't need specialized training. This is literally someone anyone in the field can do as long as they have an iPad Pro in, in minutes. And so we can go from discovering an issue on a site to having an expert anywhere else in the world looking at a 3D model of that in near real time, literally in minutes. So this is a huge leap in the ability to transmit site critical information to those who need to see it uh, in a timely way. Is this ability for anyone with, with, with very little training and very little uh, expert uh, equipment uh, to be able to create this much more, much higher fidelity representation of site issues. So that's the first part, which is the capturing. And you basically are in the field, you have your iPad Pro or, or other iPad if you're not doing 3D scans. You start creating your observations, you start tying them to pins on a map. All of this happens automatically in the background. So once you've got all of that captured, what you can do is then review this at any time, either yourself or with others. And this is through what's called the View Workspace button. So now we're going to go into an augmented reality mode. So we went from kind of being in the real world to now being in the virtual world. So when you tap the View Workspace button, you switch to AR mode in which you're now looking through the iPad so this now becomes your view on the world, and it's projecting the map and the 3D information into the space around you. So this allows for, uh, again, a lot more intuitive understanding of what it is that you did capture in another time. And also, we'll get into it a little bit later, but allows for that, that sharing uh, capability as well. So uh, when you... Play, basically find a place in your in your home office or boardroom or wherever it is that you're working and tap on the square and that will actually place a map uh, of the project site uh, in front of you. So we see an example of that here. So here is uh, some sample data uh, from from a project uh, site and we see that we have the map of the of the larger area and we have those pins, those points of interest pins that are kind of uh, jumping out of that map that shows that these were there were observations taken there. And it's immediately uh, becomes, instead of looking at a list uh, or a text list or something like that, this immediately becomes uh, reminiscent to me because it, if, even if I worked on this weeks or months ago, because I have this visual map-based representation of my data, it's so much easier for me to remember what it is I did, where I did it, and when I did it. And so this is where that intuitive aspect really becomes important. So a few things you can do in here, uh, you can tap on the map to zoom in to get more detail on, on the uh, observations and POIs that you created. Um, and you can also tap on those POIs and it will actually sort of unfurl to show all the observations that you did at that particular geographical location.
So within those observations, you can tap on the view button next to any one of them, and it will bring up the contents of those, of those observations. So that may be a photo, it'll bring up the photo, that may be a text note, it'll bring that up. And you can make changes here as well. So this is where the organizational piece comes in. So if after the fact, if you realize that some of these observations need to be recategorized or placed in a different geographical location, or need to have more information added to them, you can now uh, easily make those changes in this environment, again, in a way that, that, that makes sense to you. So you're not rolling, scrolling through a bunch of text notes. You're not scrolling through a, a camera roll trying to figure out what was what. You're literally just rewalking the site bringing up the observations in, a, in the geographical and time-based context, and then organizing your data in a way that's a lot cleaner and a lot easier to understand. So you can now flesh out your, um, your, flesh out your workspace. I just, uh, I'm gonna jump into a question here because it is timely to this. I know we've got a Q and A at the end, but I'm just gonna jump into this question here. Uh, from Demetrio. Can workspaces support time-based history? In other words, are you able to move from day to day, week to week, and review observations for a specific time? Yes, absolutely. So that's definitely the benefit of the fact that these are all time-stamped. So I'll show you a screen, and I think it's a slide or two here, where we can actually now go in and filter. And we can say, show me everything that came from this location, or this time, or this tag. And we can now build out uh, these um, uh, these relationships and, and, and look at specific uh, observations and specific points of interest and step through the different timestamps so we can actually see what changed from yesterday to today or last week to today. So yeah, thank you for that question and just uh, absolutely that is something that we can do. So we also have, if you don't like working directly on the map, we also have an observation manager uh, which is more of a list is more of a list based view. Some people do prefer that. So when you open that up, that will actually show the individual points of interest. Those are the pins on the map. And then when you open those up, it will actually show you a list of the observations that you took at that place. And you can tap on the three dots button and it will actually bring up the uh, information with that observation. So we can do this one of two ways. You can work strictly in the 3D space of the map or you can work more in the sort of regular 2D version of that as well, or you can move back and forth between the two. So here's that filter page that I was referring to that allows us to actually do that time-based um, comparison. So we see here in the pane on the left-hand side of the screen uh, that we have the ability to filter based on a variety of different things. And right at the top is date range. So we can actually now show us the things that happened today, show us the thing that happened yesterday, show us the things that happened last week, et cetera. And using this filter, and it's again, you're just sliding through, and you can basically jump through uh, the time-based observations to really quickly make those comparisons. We can also filter by observation type. We can say, just show me all the, the photos that I took here, or just show me all the 3D scans we took here. And then again, we also have the tags. And so tagging, I think, is something that everyone's pretty familiar with tags you create on the fly based on a project and allows you to organize that data at a later, later time. So it's through this filtering capability and it's, it's, this, it's this unique combination of the flat 2D interface, which gives you a really quick and easy way to, to filter using sliders and, and tap buttons. And then on the other side, the map, which is showing things in, in geographical context where this becomes really powerful and kind of a new way of, of interacting with data. So our brains really want to work with that, that data that's, that's based on the map because, again, it really triggers our memories about what work we did and where we were when we did it. But then we also want a really fast, easy-to-use interface, so that's where that filter pane comes in. So by bringing these two together, we can have the best of both worlds where we can filter through things very quickly but then see them in in time and geological context or geographical context, I should say, um, so that we can really get right down to the information that we need very quickly without having to try and remember where things were or why things were taken when they were taken. So now we get into the sharing capabilities uh, of the software. 
And the first part that we have is the ability to create a task. So if you think about when you're doing all these observations on the site and you're working with a team, it's not good enough to just have the observations. You need to, to put actions. You need to tie a, actions to that data. And so we have the ability to now add tasks, specific tasks to individual items, individual observations that have been taken on the site. And this becomes incredibly powerful for the person you're assigning the task to because they may not have uh, full, the same full familiarity uh, of the site uh, that you would. And so within that, you again, you, you invite uh, your colleague to share the map with you. And they're immediately brought to the location by viewing it through the map. And you can basically direct them to specific points of interest and specific observations that, that have some sort of problem that requires solving. And you can assign them a task that they that they would then see within the context of that visualization. So instead of just getting an email saying, you've got to go fix this thing, they get an, they get an, an invite to join your workspace through the app. So either through their HoloLens device or through their iPad or through their PC, quite frankly, they can view the site, see the contextual relationships of the observations that were taken. And now the tasks actually make sense uh, in terms of what you've assigned to them. They can actually see that in the context of the job site. So this is actually a really important leap forward in, in how we're managing tasks and assigning them to people who may not have the full uh, familiarity with the site that you do. So again, you just basically uh, tap on an observation and click on the Add Task button. And this basically gives the ability to uh, give a title and description to that task, priority to it as well. And then you'll have a list of, of your colleagues that, are, uh, that you can assign uh, to that task. And then they will get a message saying, please join this workspace, please review the data, and here's what you need to do as it relates to the objects uh, on that site, to the observations on that site. Of course, at any time, you can log in and you can actually see the tasks that are either that you've created uh, or have been assigned to you uh, under the user uh, icon in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. And uh, basically, when you ta type on the tasks, you will see a list of tasks that have been assigned to you. And again, if you're not familiar with this workspace, as you tap on each task, it will automatically move you, to move you around the map, show you the observation, whether that be a photo or a text comment or even a 3D scan of something, and you will see it in the time and uh, geographical context in which it was created. So this becomes a lot more powerful and a lot more useful um, for you. Once you've got that task, you can either add comments to it if there's a back and forth conversation that needs to happen around this, or you can mark it as complete. So the other really exciting thing is, even outside of tasks, is the ability to invite users to your workspace. So this is how we create the virtual meetings. So the way it works is you send an e you send an invite by putting in the email and you can put in a message and say, you know, this is something that's very important that I need you to see. Please log into the app. Uh, the, obviously, the other users would have to have the app installed as well. And uh, please uh, join my workspace. So they can either do that on them by themselves uh, at any time. Uh, you know, day or night, they can, they've now got, you've now given them permission to have access to your workspace and they can actually see all of the various uh, points of interest and observations that you've created. But more importantly, uh, you can then do this in a scheduled way where you can host a virtual session. So the virtual session works in a way that uh, is really unique. So if both of you are in the same room using the augmented reality, even though you're having different devices, the the map and the observations would be locked in the same place in the room and you would be seeing the exact same data in the exact same place. And if someone points at something, you would see exactly what they're pointing at. But if you're not in the same room, or if you're not in the same city or quite frankly, even the same country, this would be done in a virtual sense where you actually see an avatar of the other people that are in the space and you would actually can talk and listen to them through the, uh, through the app. And again, this could be done through the iPad or iPhone, or uh, better yet, through the uh, HoloLens from Microsoft, which gives a true mixed reality experience. And you're now in a virtual meeting. You can see, even though you're not in the same room, you're all looking at the same data. One person is, uh, is kind of managing the meeting with other people uh, uh, signed in and sharing. 
and you can bring up the various different different observations. You can bring up the three D scans, and and here's the really interesting thing about the three D scans: you can actually bring them up in one to one scale. So you can have something on a desktop uh, that you're all looking at, or you can literally blow it up uh, to fill the room to to see things at one to one scale, and then uh, literally teleport around uh, the area in in one to one scale, literally as if you were all in the space together, even though you're not even in the same room. So this ability to invite others to share your workspace is incredibly powerful, both from the perspective of uh, giving people the access so that they can see what it is that you've created in the field, but more importantly, this ability to have uh, the virtual meeting space. So I'm just, before I go to that, I'm just gonna bring up, uh, see if I can share a video here. Just give me one second on that. So I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully all of you can see that. No. Yes. Yes, you can. All right. So what, I'm, what you're seeing is, is actually the remote collaboration in action. So I'm actually recording this off of an iPad. And then we see that there's someone uh, in the same room as me on the uh, HoloLens. And what you're seeing is an actual 3D scan uh, that's being projected into the room. And again, I'm participating in this on my, I, I think it's on my iPhone, so I can just literally doing a screen record. So you're actually seeing this, you know, for real. But here's where it gets really interesting. Now you can actually see the avatars of others. So what we have is a combination of people that are working in, in one space, but also other people that are joining from a remote location. And you can see what they're pointing at, you can see what they're looking at, and you actually can hear and talk to them as well across the headsets. So this remote collaboration, again, we're bringing people together from, from all around the world using, the, using our technology. And we're able to actually uh, show that 3D workspace to them, regardless of where they're located, and have that virtual meeting. So we've had examples uh, with our clients where we have uh, shown this, uh, or used this, I should say, in, in mission critical conditions where projects uh, cannot move forward because we cannot get the people together on the site. And by using this virtual meeting technology, the, we're able to bring the experts together, show them how this works, and uh, basically allow them to make decisions. So you have another question here. Um, what security controls are provided at the different levels under workspace sharing, POIs and observations? So this is basically dependent upon uh, you uh, as the uh, as the creator. Uh, so you can basically choose. Uh, you basically can create a snapshot of your workspace if you don't want to share everything. So the default would be you just share your workspace uh, and it would be all there. But if you want to have control over that, maybe it's not appropriate for people to see uh, everything that you've captured. You create what's called a scene. Uh, from that workspace and that scene allows you to depict to, or you to choose exactly what it is you wish to share for, with that particular group, individual or group of people. So again, excellent question. Thank you. You do have that ability to, uh, to build a, a controlled environment uh, that allows you to really uh, determine exactly what it is you do and don't want to share with others. All right, so let's see if I can go back to my slides here. Yes, I can. Awesome. So the Cleario app uh, is new. And you know, Cleario has been working for quite a few years with the remote collaboration and the 3D visualization. Uh, but what we have new to the marketplace is what I've been talking about today, which is this end-to-end -end solution that allows for the field capture, for the data organization, 
as well as for uh, the ability to do the remote collaboration sharing. And so within that, uh, we basically have a new beta that we're, in, we're launching uh, to the world. And what I'd invite uh, everyone to do is actually go to the address here on the screen, CLR, clir.io slash beta, and you can actually um, sign up to join our private beta program. That would allow you to actually uh, get access to this uh, software for free during our beta period and really give it a test to see if that's going to work out for your organization. And, um, and we encourage everyone to do that because obviously we want, this is an, this is an exciting new concept and we really want to get that out into the world. If you have uh, more specific questions for me, uh, then you can email me directly, klay at clir.io, and we'll be more than happy to uh, have a conversation with you or give you a, a more in-depth demo or help you get set up with your, with your beta. So uh, thank you very much for, for the presentation uh, today. Um, uh, I'm, I know we've had a couple of questions uh, in the stream that I was able to answer, but if there are any further questions, uh, more than happy to, uh, to do those right now. Thank you very much. Um, there, I didn't record any more questions in the stream, um, but I have, um, well, I have one actually. Um, and I was curious if you ever scanned anything really, really special, um, something that you showed a lot of cool, cool things. Um, is there something that, that you think is, is well, really cool to, to mention that you, that you scanned and, and worked on? Sorry, I'm kind of, I should have put headphones on, not, so I'm kind of back and forth, but I did hear your question. Thank you very much. Um, so some of the projects that we've, we've worked on uh, are, are quite, uh, you know, quite life-changing for, for, for the people that are involved. So I, I think of a few, uh, there's a, an abandoned gold mine in Northern Canada. I'm based in Vancouver, Canada. There's an abandoned gold mine in Northern Canada that's actually posing a considerable threat with the leftover uh, toxins from that mining to the community of 20,000 people. And there's a great deal of uh, anxiety with those people around the, the health conditions that have been left from this. And so we've used this technology to take the data of the underground. Obviously, it's very hard to take 20,000 people to an abandoned gold mine full of toxic chemicals. Um, so we've used this technology to basically depict that and we'll literally take these HoloLens devices that I'm showing you here up to the community and project the entire underground mine inside a gymnasium. Like it'd be the entire length of the gymnasium. And the people in the, uh, in the, wearing the HoloLens is from the community walk around and they get a feel for what's beneath their feet. And we, we show them the engineering solution that's going to solve the problem. And it really gives them a sense of understanding and a certain sense of peace that comes with that. And that's really, you know, that's where we go beyond like, you know, solving a construction problem, which, you know, is kind of important. But when you're actually taking an entire community of people and you're giving them peace of mind uh, based on an understanding of an engineering solution, that's where you go to another level, right? That, that's where, you know, for me, that's special. Like when you actually see uh, that, um, we actually see that, that ability to, to, to impact people's lives with the technology. That's really, really cool. I see we've got a number of other questions here. Um, how translatable is the collection collaboration against observations for building complex computer systems and other abstract concepts? For example, creating a user interface for inventory management system. Um, that's a tricky question. Um, you know, certainly, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer this correctly, but certainly what's, I mean, everything that you create is exportable if you wanted to bring it into other systems. Um, but uh, I think, you know, anything that you can bring in, I mean, our, our stuff is about being uh, geographically and time-based represent, represented. So if you can actually recreate what it is you're trying to recreate in that context, it would work. I, I'm, I'm, I may not be fully understanding that question. It's a very, it's a very complex question, but, you know, uh, I do maybe follow up with me uh, via email, uh, Demetrio, 
Um, and, and I'll get a better handle on that and I, I'll get a better answer. I'm not giving you a very good answer here, I'm afraid, but I want to get a better answer for you. If you so if you would get in touch with me on that. Uh, can the scans be used in games? So yeah, I mean, if you want, again, everything that's in our, uh, um, everything that's in our uh, system can be exported. So it, if you wanted to use this as a, uh, as a really easy way to uh, take things from the real, uh, real world and, uh, and create a 3D scan of them and then bring them into, into your game environment, then absolutely. Um, I would say, you, you know, and other than using our system for creating the scans for yourself for your game, you'd still want to use, uh, you know, another game engine to build the game itself. You'd still want to be working in, in, in Unity or, or one of the other game engines. Uh, also, Misha, excellent question about the Oculus Quest. Uh, we're definitely uh, working on a version of that as we speak. We really recognize, you know, the ubiquity of the Oculus Quest uh, versus the HoloLens. You know, the HoloLens is a fantastic piece of software, uh, hardware, I should say. Uh, but the reality is, is that you can buy 10 Oculus Quest units for the price of one HoloLens. So that's a reality that we're going to have to, you know, that we're very aware of. So, yeah, excellent question, Misha, on the, on the Oculus Quest. That is coming soon for sure. We are working on that. I think that's all the questions we have. <laughs> I think it's all the questions we have. Um, so Keith, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you very much for the, the great talk. I am, I am really um, um, going to look into the system. Um, maybe I download the better. I don't have an iPad. That's the only tricky thing. Um, but it looks really, really cool. Um, thank you very much um, for the talk, and um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Timmy, for uh, moderating this, and thank you, everyone, who... Uh, oh, we have one more question. Came in. Uh, do we have... Oh, one more question. Wait. What approaches or techniques are there to control the layers? To avoid layer overload, there are dozens of different layers to choose from. So that was the filtering uh, that I was showing, and, and you know, my apologies for not getting into that in more depth, but... There's a variety of different ways you can do that. So again, time-based, so you can really limit down the time. So the the you know the observations kind of disappear from the map. If you've got tons of observations, they, they temporarily disappear from the map if you just narrow down to a specific time. Uh, you can say, just show me photos or just show me scans that can filter out the other uh, observations. Uh, and you can also do that with tags. So we really encourage people to use tags as they're creating their, their uh, observations in the field. Uh, so by having timestamps, having uh, location stamps, having uh, data types, and having tags, it really allows you to take it what would be uh, at the default an extremely busy uh, map of observations and narrow right down to to an uncluttered map of, of just specific things you're looking for. So yeah, that's an excellent question that uh, that that filter uh, screen uh, I didn't get into much enough detail on. Awesome. Well, again. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I uh, recommend that you all sign up for the beta, and uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. And if you've got any further questions, please email me directly. Thank you, Giv. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.